One type of home remedy could one day be accepted by modern medicine, as we'll see on our Eyewitness Extra. Those stories and more next on Eyewitness News Tonight, but first... At the top of the news tonight, the deadly red tide has finally made it to the beaches of South Padre Island, leaving a trail of dead fish in its wake and causing a variety of health problems for island residents and tourists. The red tide has been slowly making its way down the Texas Gulf Coast for the past six weeks. Dead fish began washing ashore on South Padre late yesterday. It is caused by tiny algae that take oxygen from the water, suffocating fish. The algae also gives off a toxic substance that causes discomfort in humans, as island resident Don Shows discovered. And all night long, me and wife was coughing and eyes burning, and we thought we were coming down with something. And this morning, we went down to the beach, and somebody told us it was red tide. It's terrible. Experts say it will take cold weather to kill off the red tide. Without it, the concentration of algae will get even heavier killing even more fish. Well, scientists aren't exactly sure what causes the red tide. It's very rare in Texas, but relatively common in Florida. Because of its severity, though, officials have been forced to close beaches to swimming from Corpus Christi to Port Mansfield. South Padre beaches have yet to be closed, but island doctors have been getting a number of calls from people affected by the red tide. Doctors stress while it is fatal to fish, it is not fatal to humans. Earlier this evening at 6 o'clock, we talked with island doctor Ralph Landsberg. I think this is just an allergic reaction, and I don't think anybody should panic. Uh, we've already heard the symptoms, uh, mostly, uh, you know, something like uh, runny nose, runny eyes, uh, an allergic reaction. One thing I would like to warn people is not to take an over-the-counter drug called Benadryl. Uh, that won't help, and it may even make some of the symptoms worse. The best advice is to stay out of the water and don't eat fish, especially shellfish, that could be contaminated by the red tide. Obviously, the situation is not welcomed by island businessmen who fear a big drop-off in tourists. Uh, luckily, though, the red tide comes near the end of South Padre's tourist season. Tonight, Hidalgo County Court at Law No. 1 Judge Manuel Trigo is free on a $5,000 bond after being indicted on third-degree felony theft charges today. The sealed indictment was handed down yesterday by an Hidalgo County grand jury and was not open until this morning. The indictment charges Trigo with theft of $9,000 from a San Juan woman. Trigo was allegedly given $10,000 to hire a Houston attorney for Eloisa Garcia. She claims the attorney was only given $1,000 and Trigo kept the rest. The district attorney's office and Texas Rangers have been investigating the case. District attorney Rene Guerra says Trigo faces up to 10 years in prison and or a $10,000 fine. This case is, uh, is not the ordinary theft case. You have uh, severe repercussions to the individual involved. The fact that he's a member of the judiciary and the fact that he's a lawyer. Uh, anybody convicted of theft uh, who is licensed by the state of Texas, well, there's repercussions there as far as the license. Eyewitness News was unable to contact Rigo for comment on the case. In the meantime, the district attorney says within the next two days, he'll be requesting that Rigo be disqualified from his duties as a county court at law judge until the case has been resolved. Around the world tonight, the Israeli government is claiming that it has rescued one of its fighter pilots shot down during an air raid over southern Lebanon earlier today. His partner, though, was reportedly killed in the raid, staged in retaliation for yesterday's terrorist grenade attack in Jerusalem. Three different groups have claimed responsibility for that attack, which killed one Israeli and injured 70 others. Some observers tonight fear the Middle East may be headed for another all-out war. More from ABC's Barry Dunsmore. According to eyewitnesses, the Israeli warplanes began their attacks in the late afternoon, flying in from the Mediterranean. Their targets were the Palestinian camps near the port city of Sidon. On the ground, Palestinians and Shiite militiamen fired back at the planes with automatic weapons, anti-aircraft batteries, and SAM missiles. Within a short time, black smoke hung over the area from bombs dropped from the planes. Fire engines and ambulances raced to the scene where a number of people were said to be wounded. During the raid, an Israeli Phantom Jet was evidently hit by a heat-seeking missile and its two-man crew bailed out over the area they had been attacking. Shiite Amal militiamen fired on the parachutes. Yes. Oh, 
An Amal spokesman said later one of the pilots was dead on landing and the other was captured. However, the Israelis say the second pilot landed safely in Israeli-held territory. As night fell, there was still a great deal of firing around Sidon. Israeli helicopter gunships are reported to be returning to the area along with units of the Israeli Navy. Gary Dunsmore, ABC News. Tonight, the death toll in El Salvador still stands at near 1,000 from last week's killer earthquake. The cleanup effort continues, and as Tom Cook reports, even in the midst of the tragedy, there is a feeling in the area that life must go on. The crisis fades with time, and life returns to normal for San Salvador, a city where thousands of poor have always made their homes in the street. Since the quake, thousands more have joined them putting up makeshift tents and lean-tos. In some areas, police will not let people return to their homes because aftershocks might lead to more deaths. They have no money and little chance of earning any, for half the population is now out of work. This woman and her husband and her four children sleep in the street. Their rickety shelter just isn't large enough for all of them. Already weakened by malnutrition and dampness, they are extremely susceptible to disease. No water, no medicines, no food. No food? No food. There is so little clean water that doctors fear dysentery and typhus could reach epidemic proportions. The children will probably suffer the most. But then they always have in El Salvador, a country where nearly half the children die before the age of 10. The quakes brought incredible death. But for many Salvadorians, Life is no different now than it was before. Tom Cook reporting from San Salvador. Well, still ahead on Outreach News tonight, a final Senate vote on the immigration reform bill is delayed. And the state of Texas is considering several plans for the future of the South Texas Hospital in Harlingen, including one that could shut down the facility. We'll be right back. In Washington, the Senate tonight had been expected to take a final vote on the immigration reform bill, already approved by the House. But the bill was pulled from debate on the Senate floor after Texas Senator Phil Graham protested against the amnesty provision for millions of illegal aliens now in the country contained in the legislation. Graham also says the bill may be too costly to implement. Senators have now turned their attention to a needed spending bill. Lawmakers are rushing to adjourn to head home to campaign for the November elections. Congress was supposed to have adjourned two weeks ago. A vote on the immigration bill could come later tonight or sometime tomorrow. Well, the state's Republican candidate for Agriculture Commissioner was in the Valley stumping for votes tonight. Bill Powers visited Raymondville and was the keynote speaker for the Willisee County Farm Bureau Convention. His Democratic opponent, Jim Hightower, was also invited to tonight's event but was unable to attend because of a scheduling conflict. Powers attacked Hightower tonight, saying the state's farmers need a leader and not a show. The main thing they're going to see with Bill Powers right off the bat is they're going to see a fellow who, uh, who shuts his mouth and opens his ears and uh, because I think an Ag Commissioner can learn much more from our farmers than he can, uh, uh, you know, with his mouth running all the time. Farmers know how to help solve their own problems. Uh, that's why I'm going to close my mouth, open my ears, and listen to the people who produce our food. Well, both Powers and Hightower will face off in the November 4th general election. Now, using table sugar to treat cuts and burns is one of the oldest folk remedies known to man. And like most home remedies, it meets with a great deal of skepticism. But sugar treatments may one day actually be accepted by modern medicine, as we'll see tonight in part three of our Eyewitness Extra. Here's Sherry Sellers. These men all have severe wounds. They're being treated in a hospital, but the treatment being used is unconventional to say the least. All are being treated with daily dressings of table sugar. Let me just turn this a little bit so we can work with you here. Okay. This young man, Dr. Richard Knudsen, an orthopedic surgeon in Greenville, Mississippi, started treating injuries with sugar 10 years ago. An elderly retired nurse recommended the old home remedy for one of the doctor's patients with a stubborn, unhealing wound. I knew it wouldn't work. I absolutely, everything in my training told me that the bacteria were going to grow at a much faster rate and I was going to hurt the patient. Several thousand sugar-treated wounds later, Dr. Knudsen has changed his attitude a lot, his home remedy a little. The sugar is now mixed with a special form of iodine. It gives it a peanut butter-like texture that's easy to apply. The compound's success rate is more than noteworthy. Knudsen has used the sugar on more than 4,000 wounds. His rate of infection is less than 1%. 
impressive when compared to a 6% national rate with conventional dressings. Dr. Knutson says he doesn't have all the answers behind why the treatment works, but he's convinced it does, and with the growing